Well, as John Wesley, he was the founder of the Methodist movement, as he rode across um, Hounslow Heath late one night singing a favorite hymn, he was startled by a demanding voice shouting, Halt! while a firm hand seized the horse's bridle. Then the man demanded, Your money or your life? Wesley emptied his pockets of the few coins they contained and invited the robber to examine his saddlebags, uh, which were filled with books, of course. Uh, disappointed at the result, the robber ha uh, was turning away when the evangelist cried out, Stop! I have something more to give you. The robber, wondering at the strange command, stopped and turned back. Then Wesley, bending down from his horse toward the man, said in solemn tones, My friend, you may live to regret this sort of life in which you are engaged. If you ever do, I beseech you to remember this. The blood of Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The robber hurried silently away, and the man of God rode along, praying in his heart that the word spoken might be fixed in the robber's conscience. Years later, at the close of a Sunday evening service, with the people leaving the building and many lingering around the doors to see the aged old preacher, John Wesley, a stranger stepped forward and asked to speak to Mr. Wesley. What a surprise to find that it was the robber of Hounslow Heath, now a well-to-do tradesman in the city, but better still, a child of God. The words spoken that night long ago had been used by God in his conversion. Raising the hand of Wesley to his lips, he kissed it and said, To you, dear sir, I owe it all. Wesley softly replied, Nay, nay, my friend, not to me but to the precious blood of Christ, which cleanseth us from all sin. That's a cool story, isn't it? It's a way in which many of us have influence on other people. Some that uh, may just be a one-time encounter like this. But that story called John Wesley an evangelist. Does anyone know what an evangelist is? Anyone? A teacher? Okay. A teacher of? I'm sorry, what? The gospel, the good news? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, um, I went back to, to my seminary books and, and got a, act, you know, a definition that's in those. And, and it's exactly that. But to share the hope God um, has given us through Jesus Christ to share that hope with who? Everyone, that's right, especially those who may not have that hope. So in, in that case, if that's what it means to evangelize, what is a church community then? What is a church community? <laughs> Somebody's playing the piano. Um, somebody may want to go down and tell them that we can hear them playing the piano. Um, although it's a nice piano playing. So a community um, is uh, in the church, a, a church community, individuals which make up that church community, right? As a matter of fact, um, you could say that uh, the individuals within that community, when they come together, they are the... They are the church, right? They are the church. And um, they have that hope and they emulate or they imitate or they follow or they model that hope to the world. Does that make sense? So this community is to model the hope we have in Jesus Christ to the world. Is everybody with me? All right, so then if this church community is to model the hope that is found in Jesus Christ as individuals in this church community, what are we to do outside of these church walls? Anyone? Hmm? Share the good news, right? To model the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, all right? To share with others that hope, inviting them to this community. Why? So that they too can share in the hope that we have. 
the joy that we have found. So a church community is a community that emulates or models God's hope and that has individuals within that church community, as individuals within that church community, we should share with others the hope we have in Jesus Christ and invite them to this very church community. And now the only, the only question we have left to answer is who do we share this hope with? Who do we invite to become a part of our church community here at the First United Methodist Church, right? And, and the, the hope and the answer is, is the unchurched, right? Those who have never experienced this hope. I mean, we want everyone, right, to be invited. But we especially want those who um, don't understand the salvation message. That Jesus, right, died on the cross for them, for you, for me. And was raised again by God. Invites us to this hope and this joy that we have. So, you know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says that we are to no longer regard people from a human point of view. What in the world does that mean? So, so before we look at today's scripture, I want to um, go back just a little bit and take a look at the book of Acts. All right. Now, the book of Acts is essentially, uh, among other things, it is essentially a story of how the church started, on how there wasn't one central church. There was a church in many houses throughout communities, right? Now, about the middle of Acts is when that happens. Why? Because in the beginning, there was a central church in what community? Jerusalem, right? And an interesting thing happens. So just uh, take a trip with me back here just a little bit. Because my question in, in, in looking at this is, how did the church arrive at a turning point where insiders were willing to include outsiders? How did the church come about that? You see, like I said, Acts began in Jerusalem where the good news has been taken out into Samaria, then uh, with the conversion of the Ethiopian to the very ends of the earth, quote-unquote, in chapter 1, verse 8. Then Saul, a vile persecutor of the community, um, about halfway through, uh, halfway through the book of Acts, becomes the apostle Paul, God's chosen Instrument And the story of Peter and Cornelius is the longest story in the book of Acts and could be, quite honestly, a pivotal story for the church in the whole book of Acts. And so as we, uh, if I were to ask you to open your Bibles, we would begin in chapter 10 and for a moment try to think like a Jew of Peter's day would think. So, so try to, um, you know, if you have to, close your eyes just, and it may be your sole idea of what a Jew would think in Peter's day, but that's all right. Just try to take yourself back there and understand with me. Listen to my voice. Cornelius was a Gentile. Peter, remember, was a Jew and someone who was a follower of Christ, all right? So, but the Cornelius was a Gentile. He was not just a Gentile. In other words, he was not just not a Jew, right? But he was a Roman. And not only was he a Roman Gentile, but he was a Roman army officer who was a devout man that feared God. <clears throat> the church was still controlled by the apostles in Jerusalem. And remember, they were first Jews who then became followers of Christ. And they still believe that Jesus came to save the Jews alone. All right, are you with me? So many wonder, as we talk about this, many wonder if that's why the persecution came to the Jerusalem church. Because Christianity, after the persecution, ended up spreading like wildfire when the apostles were forced out of their comfort zone, right? So when the, when the apostles were forced out, Christianity began to spread throughout that region. So we need to remember that Cornelius was not only a Gentile and a Roman, 
but a Roman army officer who was directly responsible for oppressing the Jews. All right? And this Cornelius now had a vision. And his vision, while he was praying, was to send for this man named Peter. So the second section that I'm talking about today in the book of Acts begins with Peter praying on a roof and seeing a vision of a large sheet being lowered containing all animals except for fish. Some of you may be familiar with this story at this point. And Peter is told to slaughter and eat. So it contains all animals except for fish. And in, while he's in this prayer state, he is told to slaughter all the animals and eat. This happens three times. But Peter now, showing his loyalty to the sacred dietary laws of Jewish tradition, he refuses to eat them. Those of us who sit on this side of this story have to be careful because this seems kind of like no big deal to us. After all, many of us eat raw fish, right, Justin? So, um, but uh, uh, to a minority community where a bit of pork or a pinch of incense offered to Caesar or a little interracial marriage was a matter of life and death for this community. All right, so am I adding on the layers here as we um, um, go through this? Now, the dietary laws are not a matter of etiquette, right, or peculiar culinary wants, right? They are, um, it's a matter of survival and identity for the Jews. And, and needless to say, Peter's vision of this sheet with animals on it and a voice telling him to eat really confuses Peter. Do you understand why that confuses Peter? Because after all, Jews, anything with a split hoof, that is against their law to eat. All right? So, so which is a pig, for instance, as an example. All right, so um, it really confused Peter. And so the third section begins with Cornelius' messengers arriving in Joppa, seeking this man named Peter. And like a good disciple, we could include, uh, well, which could include us, uh, Peter is thinking, Lord, I don't know where you're leading me, right? But here I am. Who all has been in that situation in their life? Lord, I don't know where you're leading me, but I'm, I'm going to go, right? I'm going to go. So as we look at this next section, it begins by Peter entering Cornelius' home. Peter has already broken Jewish law just by associating himself with this company. Now he's broken Jewish law again by entering their home. All right, are you sticking with me this morning? Luke, who wrote Acts, is trying to get us to see the dual nature of this story, right? It's a story about the conversion of both a Gentile, Cornelius, and the conversion of a Jew, Peter, right? Both Cornelius and Peter need changing if God's mission is going to go forward in the world of that day. God's vision to Peter finally sinks in when he confesses, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So Peter's sermon begins, and it begins with the statement, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to God. He continues preaching about Jesus Christ being the Lord of all. And while he was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word, and they began speaking in tongues and extolling God. Can you imagine how Peter felt, you know, the other Christian Jew felt in the room, right? Can you imagine how that was? It might have been their worst nightmare, right? Can you imagine? How is it to you whenever the person that you despise the most, God seems to just bless all over the place, right? How does that feel to you, right? You're like, oh, man, 
What is up with that, right? Am I the only one that does that? Okay. All right. So, so yeah, I mean, this may have been the worst day of their lives. Can you imagine the, the talk in that Jerusalem church? Can you imagine what was said about Peter in that Jerusalem church? So in other words, the, the Holy Spirit fell. They began speaking in tongues and extolling God. And, you know, like I said, it might have been their worst nightmare as far as the Jewish Christians were concerned. God was accepting these dirty, good-for-nothing, lazy Gentiles who were oppressing other people. The vision Peter had earlier was not simply about unclean food. It was about unclean people, right? It was also about our inability to know who is clean or unclean. So what does Peter do? Well, he offers them baptism, and that is a a serious no-no. He says, you know what? If God has accepted them, who are we to keep baptism from them? Why does he do that? Because if Jesus ascended to reign with the creator of all creation, Jesus is Lord of all creation, right? And cannot be Lord of only part of creation. More specifically in their terms, the part that they chose, right? Because if you think about Jewish um, history, what did they do almost their entire n- n- the history of their nation? Where did they keep God? In a box, right? Literally, right? In a box. And, and suddenly God is saying, I'm sorry, folks, but you cannot keep me in a box. And so think about it. During his sermon, Peter is struggling with this new um, perception of the movement of the gospel. He has no text to justify himself. He is out on risky terrain without tradition or without scripture to back him up. And I mean, quite honestly, isn't this the way it is sometimes in today's church? If Jesus is Lord, then the church has the adventurous task of penetrating new areas of his lordship, right? Expecting surprises and new implications of the gospel which cannot be explained on any basis other than the fact that Jesus has shown us something we could not have seen on our own. We have to be faithful to that divine, you know, whenever uh, I was raised, being raised and we would raise cattle, we, some of our favorite things were a cattle prod, Right? I mean, I mean, when we were trying to get that, uh, that cow in there to uh, either give it medicine or whatever, we had many times prodded along to go because you don't want to get in there with that cow. I've seen them, boy, they're strong animals now. So you push that prod through there, right? A little volt of electricity goes through them, and they decide to go where you want them to go. And, and uh, so we have to be faithful to that divine prodding. Amen. An aspect of faith, when it comes down to it, is our often breathless attempt to keep up with the redemptive activity of God, and we keep asking ourselves, what on earth are you doing, God? So what on earth is God doing with First Church? Where is God taking us? Who is acceptable here at First Church? If everyone is acceptable, why aren't they here? Could it be they don't feel welcome, possibly? That they are afraid they won't be accepted? Could that be the problem? Could all of these feelings be because simply they aren't being invited? Why aren't they here? So now listen again as Paul restates this same, very same concept Except this time, it isn't for Jewish Christians. It's for Gentile Christians. So listen again, hopefully, with new ears. And Jesus died for all, Paul says, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we, re- we regard no one from a human point of view. 
Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself. What does it mean to reconcile? To make peace with? And, and the two little letters in the beginning of that, what does that mean? To do again, right? So, so the word reconciliation implies that at one time we had a relationship with God and Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was about reconnecting us in that relationship with God. Do you follow that? So anytime you hear the word reconciled or reconciliation, that is a word that deals with us being reconnected not connected for the first time, but being reconnected with the creator of all that is, right? So, um, who reconciled us, who made a new relationship uh, or made a relationship again with us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their tra trespasses against them. So, in other words, Christ died for everybody. Everybody, whether they recognized that Christ died for them or not. Christ died for everybody. The atheist to the people who believe that they're atheists and really aren't, right? To Christians who think they're Christians and really aren't. Right? Not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are what? ambassadors for Christ since God is making this appeal through us so because Jesus died for all and God through Christ has reconciled us to himself if you are in Jesus you are now living for him and not yourself Paul says from now on therefore we regard no one from a human Point of view. We are to be about the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul tells us the way that we can be about the ministry of reconciliation is to be ambassadors for Christ. This reconciliation is not only about the relationship between others and God, which we are to be a part, but we are also to be about reconciling the relationship between each other. You see, God is making this appeal through us. Remember how I said a few weeks ago that the longer I do this, the more I come to understand that sin is whenever a relationship is hurt or destroyed? Remember me saying that? That's what reconciliation is all about, is reconciling those things, overcoming that sin in our life. You see, we ambassadors have full power to speak for the government that they represent and can commit it to a course of action. Right? So ambassadors today to different countries, right? Ambassadors have full power to speak for the United States government. Full power. So if we think of ourselves as ambassadors of Christ then we also need to remember the responsibility that goes along with being an ambassador of Christ. Amen? In what we say, in what we do, we commit Jesus to it. Do we understand that? We are not these little ants on a hill, right? If we truly are in Christ, what we say and what we do, we commit Jesus to that. Remember in, G in Matthew, Jesus says that whatever promises are made on earth, right? What happens? They will be in heaven also, right? As ambassadors, Jesus is judged by others by how we represent him. You see, people whose sins have been washed clean through the blood of Jesus, we are to be ambassadors of Christ with all the privileges and responsibilities of the position. 
And as an ambassador, we are to be about the ministry of reconciliation. That is, renewing people's relationship with God through Christ and renewing our relationship with folks around us. As I uh, bring this to a close, I I want to read um, the message. Sometimes, uh, whenever, if you have the message, it's a great devotion Bible. It's a great way for us to uh, maybe see things in a new light. But listen, this is the exact same scripture. Listen to this. Our firm decision is to work from this focus center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrection life, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. Let me repeat. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. We are an ambassador, right? We are speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How, you ask? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong. So we could put, be put right with God. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes it puts it in a way that makes so much sense. One lady criticized D.L. Moody for his methods of evangelism and attempting to win people to the Lord. Moody's reply was, well, I agree with you. I don't like the way I do it either. But tell me, how do you do it? The lady replied, I don't do it. Moody replied angrily, then I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. So today, as an ambassador of Christ, be about the ministry of reconciliation. That's both with God and with each other. Invite those around you to participate in the hope that you have. You know that a personal invitation is the most powerful form of invitation and don't get discouraged if you're rejected know that you did your best remember Wesley's story it may be years later before God is able to heal that person right share the hope that you have in Christ amen invite people to this awesome place I think y'all are awesome I hope that uh, you think those around you are awesome as well be an ambassador for Christ Let's pray. Holy God, we love you and we thank you. We give you praise that you think so much of us, Lord, and Jesus, that uh, you give us the opportunity to be an ambassador for you. Anoint us fully with your Holy Spirit, God. Give us your strength and your courage. Help us, Lord, to maybe move out of our comfort zones and expand your kingdom. Because we realize that as we look back in Scripture many times, it is when people were in the hardest places of their life that suddenly the gospel began to spread and that your word and your healing began to spread around this earth. We love you, God. We pray that you allow us to be a part of what you're doing here in Warsaw and Benton County. We love you, God, in Jesus' name.